Well, Tom, Tom Reynolds gave a great perspective from a very large, very large company. Now we're going down in size to a medium-sized corporation, and then we'll close with a small enterprise. I'd like to take this time to introduce Jose Amarista. His bio, again, is in front of you. I'll just note that um, he is a product of our executive MBA program here, which we're proud to say. He comes from a very dynamic, innovative company, Cadbury Schweppes, which is really um, keeps a low profile. However, they are in our, back, in our backyard, and um, I think we're all looking forward to see what innovations um, come from that company, as well as some of the cultural dimensions uh, that Jose will elaborate on. Jose Amarista. Good morning, everyone. Just have a, I had a question for Tom, but I wanted to keep it for, for, save it for now. Will chewing gum qualify as a... Um, as a moderate exercise for staying young. <laughs> so, then you can start right now. You have your samples on your table, so start now. Burn calories. Oh, we, you, you, you do burn calories, yes. So that's a business opportunity right there. In, that's innovation right there. So successful innovation in confectionery, like uh, as, uh, Jim mentioned, this is a totally different business. The, um, the, the, I guess the, uh, the, the fundamental difference is uh, what drives consumers to uh, consume our products. So um, clearly, I mean, there's no, we don't have to push too much to, uh, to, for that to happen. The agenda for, for uh, my presentation will be a quick uh, company overview so everybody knows what Cadbury Shrapes what, uh, does and uh, where it comes from, etc. A uh, few definitions. I, I wasn't sure I mean, how many people in R&D we have here. I know you're in R&D. How many people in R&D? I know you're in R&D too. Yeah, excellent. Uh, how many people in marketing? Okay, very good. So uh, those definitions, I think, will, will help introduce the uh, how we do innovation in confectionery, how to select the right projects, very important, and then a few uh, case studies uh, from our, our success uh, stories from our company. Cadbury Schweppes is the world leading, we're the largest confectionery company in the world right now, with a 10% share. Uh, Cadbury Schweppes evolved from, uh, from being a UK-based, uh, or UK Commonwealth-based uh, company to a global company. Um, part of that was due to a recent acquisition, of which I'm, uh, I witnessed and I went through that, the Adams business from Pfizer. So um, that, uh, there was a, a clear synergy because uh, Cadbury had a strong presence in the former Commonwealth, and Adams had a, a strong presence everywhere else. So there was a clear synergy there. So that was, that was actually good. It helped Cadbury expand globally. Um, so this is in New York and London. Um, market cap of uh, 20 billion, that was in 2005. And the important thing, we're in a growing mode. We are, we're growing, profitable growing mode, which is a good place to be. Um, next, net sales is in British pounds. We're a British company. Everything is in pounds. 60% uh, of a business is in confectionery, 40% in beverages. We also have uh, very well-known brands in beverages, Dr. Pepper, etc. cetera. Um, the revenue growth, um, 4%. The important thing about that is that uh, if you look at the, uh, the next line, out of that 4%, 10% came from just chewing gum, and 23% uh, from the Trident brand, which you're chewing right now. So that's, that's remarkable, that's important, that's a, that's a, a, a key headline here. Um, the other important headline here is that uh, emerging markets account, accounted for 10%, I mean, grew, grew 10%, sorry, in, in, uh, in 2006. That's, that's remarkable, too. So we're heavily investing in innovation. Um, we have 650 people globally in the function. In, in the, we call it S&T, R&D. We call it science and technology, S&T. Uh, we have four technical centers. One, like uh, Jim mentioned, just um, up the road from here in Whippany on Route 10. Um, we have um, a, a technical center in uh, the University of Reading in the UK. One that, uh, uh, we recently opened a, a technical center in Singapore, which is um, Remarkable that we have a technical center developing chewing gum in, in Singapore, but uh, we, 
And we have a, another technical center in Lille in France. Lille is in a, it's a, um, uh, um, outside Paris. Innovation is a priority. And is that what's driving growth in our, in our company? And um, our, um, let's say, uh, philosophy is to uh, be focused on fewer, faster, bigger, better. So that's a good, the big thing now in Cadbury. Is, uh, we call it F square, B square. F fewer, fewer, faster, bigger, better. Um, the reason, it's obvious, is, uh, is uh, efficiency in, in, uh, I mean, if you think of our products, I mean, we, we are, we're, we're mass products, so uh, we have to be efficient. We have to try to leverage worldwide. We have to try to, uh, you know, focus one thing and, uh, and reapply elsewhere. So, so we have a, a plenty of examples. One is uh, we launched uh, Trident Splash. I don't know if uh, you have seen the commercials on TV. Trident Splash was developed centrally and was expanded in 14 countries. And in the first year, it, it reached 100 million pounds, which is roughly $200 million. So, that's, those numbers are mind-blowing. That's a lot of gum to sell, $200 million. Have an history in innovation. I'm sure that a lot of people know and, and can relate to some of these brands. We have the first of a lot of things. We have the first sugarless gum in the market, Trident. We have the first gum with uh, functional benefits, uh, Trident again. Uh, we have uh, the first uh, center field bubble gum. Center, we have uh, the first of many things. So we, we, uh, we have a... Uh, Clearly an innovation edge in the market. We have long established brands, like I mentioned. Global presence. We have a quite balanced uh, um, presence in the, in, in the world. Um, we have two separate divisions in, uh, in, in the Americas. Confectioner, which is essentially Adams, and, um, and the Americas Beverages, uh, which includes Mexico and, and the US. Like I mentioned, those, those um, Brands that you all, all know, 7-Up, Dr. Pepper, Snapple, Mott, etc. All those brands are part of the America's Beverages. On the um, America's Confectionery, that's a group that, that, that we belong to, uh, we have Trident, Dentin Ice, Halls. Those are probably our, our um, most well-known known brands. Um, we have also Stride that you have in your tables. That's our newest uh, uh, innovation. And we'll talk about that later. Very important, local heroes. I mean, the emerging markets represent a significant portion of not only of ourselves, but also our focus and effort. In fact, I lead a group. I mean, my, my function is in, in, uh, in Latin America. I have uh, groups in, in Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia. But I also have a small group here that provides technical service for, for uh, emerging markets. So we, that's, a, that's an important focus, and that's... that's uh, to, requires a different mindset because uh, developing products, and if you notice, these are all single pieces and different products. And uh, so developing products that are accessible to everybody and are affordable is a challenge, and, but that's, that's also a focal point for a company. So that, that's an important piece of our, what we do. So to that point, I mean, and, and that uh, you know, always uh, you know, actually pays off because uh, we, we, we had a 10%, 10% of our growth came from, from emerging markets. Questions so far? Cadbury Schweppes, we're in, you know, had presence, uh, globally, world presence, we're in a growing mode, we're an innovative company, we, we, uh, with innovation is, uh, is our, it's, uh, part of our core, uh, you know, uh, priority. <coughs> Few definitions. Tom uh, covered this, uh, I will only add to that, that um, innovation has to be valued by community, it has to be valuable, otherwise it's not innovation, and we'll see a couple of examples where that doesn't happen. And innovation is about a process. It's not something that you just you know, occurs to you and then that you, it has to be consumer driven. It has to be you know, consumer relevant to be successful. Some successful innovations that I mean similar to the ones that we have. <laughs> Very original on that. Um, we were not, we, we, we didn't talk about this. We think alike. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so that's a, uh, Important, the thing is, there's not, no limit to what, how you can innovate. And, uh, and contrary to what uh, people tell you, well, don't reinvent the wheel. If you're in the business of uh, reinventing the wheel, you should. And there's an example here. That's why I have this uh, slide here. Michelin actually reinvented or tried to reinvent the wheel. I don't know when this will be in the market, but uh, this is a totally different wheel. It has no air, for one, it will, so you never get a flat. Probably can break it, but you will never get a flat. That's the way it looks. 
Um, but not all innovations are successful. So I found this in the, uh, in the um, patent um, um, uh, web pages. The first one is a machine to uh, simulate a high five. <laughs> the second one is a, a method of exercising a cat with a laser beam. And the third one is a greenhouse helmet. So who needs those? I don't know. What was the drive? So not all innovations are guaranteed to be successful. They have to be consumer relevant, and they need to have some specific you know, uh, applicability. Specifically, I mean, they have to come from the market. So th this, this is probably the cycle. I mean, the, the market generates consumer needs. These consumer needs may come from consumers, but they may also may be created by a new technology breakthrough. So if you have something new and different, you create a need. There's a plenty of examples of that. I mean, uh, washing machines, uh, uh, dishwashers, uh, CDs, um, the, the iPod. I mean, that, that nobody was, uh, was specifically asking for it, but uh, there was a technology, there was an opportunity to, to provide portable private places, which is in, in, in the, the essence of that. I mean, that when, when they, uh, they uh, launched the, uh, the Walkman in Japan, one of the, uh, the key focus for, 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 for uh, the developers was to provide, I don't know if you have, you have seen even in, in, uh, in movies or whatever, how the, uh, the subway trains work in Tokyo. They're packed with people. They have people whose job is just to push people inside the trains. That's how packed they are. So uh, if you're in, in, in that situation and you commute for one hour in those trains, you will go crazy very, very, very quickly. So one, one solution that Walkman brought to, to consumers is that that provides you to put up your own private place. So you, when you're in that, uh, you know, crowded train, you still have your, you listen to your music or whatever you want to listen to. So that, that's kind of the concept. So you have the, the technology, you can, you can quickly find a, 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 an application to that and you immediately create a need. That's, that's important. Trends, of course, uh, create, the, create the, generate needs. There's new trends. I mean, I have two daughters. Uh, the, the, the oldest daughter is four years old and she already has, you know, her own needs based on trends. She, she in, I don't think I need to explain that uh, any further, but that, that's clear. I mean, that, that, that new trend generating needs immediately. So then we get into the product development cycle. I'll talk about these, uh, these uh, IFDL, uh, DCL, what they mean. That's the stages and gates uh, um, uh, process. Then we launch the product, goes into the market. The products in the market, I mean, they, after a while, they, they become obsolete or people, you know, get bored of them, tired, whatever, so they need to be re renovated, that generates the need, and that's how the cycle starts. So that's how we make, or we, we um, get a feel for how uh, innovation can be relevant to consumers. That's how we know we have to refer to the market and the consumers. Consumer product fundamentals. Consumer product has three key elements, concept, product, and f uh, uh, formula, and package. The concept and it's a statement of what the product does, I mean, what the need it, it is addressing or what benefit it's providing. That's important because the concept is what, uh, what makes consumers believe that's, that's what makes uh, the rich toothbrush brush sell at a premium price and people will still buy it. And people buy it over the, uh, the uh, generic brand. In the, in, when you go to the CVS, you have like a thousand of them, but you go to the rich because that, that's promising you something that the others don't promise. Formula or in the case of any other product, components, uh, ingredients, etc., are ingredients, components combined by a process that's an essential part also of a product. The process, how you make it is essential to the product that deliver the benefit and include the active ingredients or the active components that fulfill the concept. That's very important. If the product doesn't fulfill the concept, the first time you try the product, it's dead. And package is very important, I mean, extremely important, because the package is not only a vehicle to get the product to the consumer, it also plays an important role when the product is displayed in the store or the point of purchase. That's, that's a, a, an essential element, and, and we'll see later how important it is in, in, uh, in connecting consumer emotionally with, with our product. Consumer Moments of Truth. This is a model developed by um, Mr. Laffley, the uh, um, PNG CEO. He said, well, enough with this theory. Let's go to the market and see uh, uh, 
analyze the, the, uh, the phenomenon of how consumers or how shoppers how, uh, become consumers. And I was uh, talking about that earlier, that uh, I, mean, I, don't need, I don't need to, uh, I think, explain too much uh, how much I mean, of uh, shopping. Well, my wife does a lot of shopping, and she finally buys. But so, so turning that, uh, that uh, you know, browsing around into uh, buying something specific takes uh, a few hours, depending on, on the item, specific item. So capturing that and, and analyzing that phenomenon, what drives consumers to choose one product over the other, is very important. It's a very important element in, in, in analyzing consumer behavior. So the first one is uh, um, when consumers are faced with a product in the store and they have to make a decision, they have to buy one over the other. So there, there's a reaction to a product on the shelf, so that's driven by packaging, that's driven by what you do in the, uh, in, in the store, in the store advertising, so the enablers for that is an emotional engagement in general, so you need to uh, engage consumer with your product. There has, there has to be something in the shelf, and itself can come also from advertising. In the advertising, you basically, you know, throw the message that your product does A, B, C, and the others don't, and then when, the, when consumer, and we as consumers know that, or as shoppers know that. We get to the store and we remember, oh, this is a product that says ABC. So that, that, that's in your mind. So there's a certain engagement already in your mind in, in, to, that por to that purpose. Product display, of course, is important. Um, In-store advertising and, and um, communicating news, in, in, I mean, say, saying that, well, if you, if you put like new, when, when you do something to your product, you have to advertise it in the store because a lot of people don't watch TV or don't, don't get to see the commercials. So the only advertising they see is the one you do in the store. So that's, that's important. So, so this is an important enabler. Second moment of truth is uh, after consumers try the product. So they try the product. Then what's important here is the, the ingredients. And the product has to deliver upon the concept and the, all the advertising that you that promised, uh, you know, ABC. So if the product doesn't deliver, consumers will probably be disappointed I won't try the product again. So concept fulfillment is paramount for, for, uh, for the second moment of truth. And uh, product quality, very important. Consistent product quality. If, you, if your quality declines, you probably have uh, one, two repurchases, and that's it. Then consumers immediately notice that your product changed, and they won't buy it again. There's a third moment of truth. These are the original two. There's a third moment of truth, and this is coming, coming out in the internet right now. The third moment of truth is uh, after consumers chose a product, tried the product, you know, had a reaction to it, and it's about le letting, letting consumers talk about the, uh, the experience. That's very important because creating that channel, creating the, the, the communication channel with consumers provides you with very useful insight, very relevant information about your product, so you will know why your consumers like or dislike your product, very specifically, very emotionally, and so, so these uh, customer service lines are important. Nowadays with the internet, it's very easy to um, open up for consumers to, to provide uh, insight. There's a, there's a, so, so the, the enabler is, is a, uh, opening the communication pipeline. There's a, one, one uh, um, company, uh, General Mills, recently opened the, uh, their, their website to inventors. So inventors can provide inventions or, or ideas you know, more, 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 more like um, patents that uh, could be applicable to their products. So that's probably taking this to, to, uh, to uh, the, the next level, basically. So how would you do this in, in, in confectionery? What are the uh, important elements? And, and I'm center, this center around gums. Um, first of all, we in, have to intersect our technologies. And there, believe me, there's a lot of technology in, in, uh, in chewing gum. Believe it or not. So the, the products you're testing right now have a lot of technology behind them. In the past, formulations were very simple. Uh, there were very limited uh, choices of products, and there was very limited consumer insight. There was, it was, uh, we knew very little about consumers. We just threw the products in the market, and we had very basic you know, ways to, to, um, to um, ask consumers what they thought about our products. That uh, has evolved. Our formulations are a lot more complex. There's um, a lot more restrictions, regulations, etc. A lot of ingredients that were allowed uh, 20 years ago are not allowed today, so we had to develop 
substitutes for that. We have allergens, we have uh, uh, genetically modified uh, uh, materials that cannot be used in certain markets. So things are m far more complex now. So getting, uh, developing products right now, I mean, consumers, the market are becoming more demanding. So that also demands in turn that we do things a little different and, and put more science behind them. So what that translates into is that it requires different facets of innovation. It's not, not just uh, changing the color in the package. It's not just uh, uh, launching a new flavor. It takes a lot more than that. So we need to go deeper to the fundamentals, develop new concepts, develop things that uh, deliver those concepts. So it's, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, examples of this, we have fun formats. And uh, again, looks simple, but um, one thing that to bear in mind here is that confectionery products are an engineer's uh, nightmare. They're very small piece sizes, and the machines work at extremely high speeds. So um, an engineer will be like, oh, I don't want that. Because the fishes are very high. Our cost uh, structures are very tight also. So in a couple of points in, in percent of efficiency in our lines could be you know, the life or death for, for the product. So, so that's important. So, so Coming up with new formats is a challenge. It's, it's not trivial at all. Um, developing functional benefits is a big piece of that. We have products with functional benefits. That product you're trying in your table, we'll talk about that later, has functional benefits clinically proven. Flavors, of course, and formulation. So not only flavor, new flavors. Also flavor extensions, flavor combinations, flavor sensations, cooling, warming, etc. Different sensations. That, that's, that's a, that, it goes beyond just the flavor character itself. And finally, packaging. Packaging is an important piece, again. It uh, not only has a, the function of protecting the product and, 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 and delivering that to consumers, it also has a, a display function, very important. And, and, and it's, it has to be a, a, a product advocate, a concept advocate. What makes a great tasting gum? And I think you have a stride in your tables. So you tell me if you like it or not. And also makes you younger, so uh, makes you feel younger. Then we really like it. There's uh, different elements in a gum. We have gum base. It's a uh, gum base is uh, the uh, component that remains in your mouth after you chew for um, say five minutes. That's a gum base. That's another challenge. I mean, gum. You don't swallow gum, so, so all the benefits have to come out of that uh, piece that, that just still remains in your mouth. That piece that remains in your mouth after the sweeteners are gone has to deliver flavor, sweetness, etc. That's the challenge in itself. Categorizing flavors, I mean, that's, it's arguable whether uh, flavor is a, is a point of distinction in, in a product because Flavor houses sell flavors to our competitors too. So how we combine that, how we that, uh, add the, the unique touch to our products is also a challenge and it's also a point of differentiation. To, um, that, that we were discussing earlier that uh, one, one way to what drives consumers to buy our products over other products besides the concept before, when we go past the uh, first moment of truth is basically that character liking. That, that's very specific to our products, different to, to competitors. That's a challenge too. So uh, technologies to deliver flavor and sweetness uh, over a periods of time is also a challenge. Entails technology, entails uh, processing technologies to deliver the, uh, the uh, actives to, uh, to, uh, for that to happen. And finally, the, the modifying texture is also uh, um, one other uh, piece of, of, uh, of uh, challenging uh, uh, effect. In the case of Stride, we're targeting consumers that chew gum for a long, long periods of time. So um, when you chew gum, the, so the reason why you, you stop chewing gum is because there's no flavor or because uh, the texture becomes really, you know. So we address that. We address that. So you can chew, you can chew a Stride for a long period of time, and it will still have flavor, sweetness, and the texture will be still pleasant. I think I mentioned this briefly, but uh, why is it difficult? People will say, well, what's, what's uh, big about, uh, what's the deal with chewing gum? Why what, do what, what you need so much technology? Well, I think I mentioned a couple of challenges. One is that uh, the, the piece size and the, 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 the volumes of production we, we sell are so, so big that uh, that that's makes a challenge in itself. Our formulations are complex, have many individual ingredients. Any, any given gum formulation has uh, 12, 15 components. 
all together, and you break down the specific components, that's even more. So that's, that's challenging. Getting long-lasting flavor, I mean, we have the equivalent. In one piece of gum, we have a equivalent of several uh, uh, scoops of, uh, of sugar. Of course, uh, not the calories, but the, uh, sweet, the sweetening power. So uh, be, you're safe. Keep chewing. Um, so, so packing that together in a, in a small space, uh, that's also a challenge. And like I mentioned, combining, combining everything together and up, uh, scaling up uh, in, in uh, the, the volumes and the speeds that we work with is a challenge also. So summary, market success depends on, number one, focus on the basics, like I mentioned, your concept, your product, had to be, and package had to be linked, had to be consistent, had to be interdependent. That's very important, that's crucial. Second is the right product for the right, right channel. This is a, not a subject for a different presentation. I mean, that, that's, that's a whole uh, issue in itself. I mean, we were uh, discussing earlier several cases where, where we have products, we had the right products in the wrong channel, it, it didn't go through, uh, or we had the, 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 wrong, the, the, the wrong product in the right channel. That, that also uh, it's, it's a, doesn't work. Product performance, like I mentioned, to get product, uh, consumers past the, uh, the, um, the first moment of truth, had the product has to deliver and keeps consumers coming back. And selecting the right projects, which is the next, how we select the right projects. Very briefly, there's um, the funnel the, the, um, uh, approach where we have the fuzzy front end with new technologies, all this information that uh, comes from different sources, from, from um, consumers, from technologies, etc. How so? So we have to sort of uh, get a, 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 a logical array and put that in a, in the form of a project. That that's also uh, challenging. So uh, and requires uh, dedicated teams. That requires uh, multifunctional teams. Not only S and T or R and D that does that or marketing. You need input from the, all the functions, legal, regulatory, etc. Maybe they have the brightest idea, but it, it's not approved. By, it's not FDA approved. You can't do it. So portfolio management process, when we get that uh, bank of ideas, how we select the right ones. So we go to the idea phase where we sculpt the idea, make sure that it makes sense, it, it fits our strategy, and it, and it makes sense to, for, for, for the consumer, uh, our consumer segments, uh, uh, et cetera. Going to the feasibility phase when we, where we test the concept and, and we get the, uh, a feel for, for whether it is relevant or not, or whether it's gonna, it's gonna really result in, 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 um, in uh, incremental business. Um, we prepare the business case. Up to this point, we haven't prepared a prototype yet. Uh, up to this point, if, 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 if we have the right, so we define what hurdles the product has to clear, and then we, we move forward, and then uh, we'll go to the development phase, where we develop the prototypes, we test them with consumers, then we, get, we, we see if we, we match or we, we clear the hurdles that we, we thought the product had to, to clear. Finally, we uh, scale up, to, so we test and validate. So everything that, uh, that uh, was true on a small scale has to happen also at a large scale, so we have to, to confirm that the product, uh, the scale-up product still meets the same parameters that, that, the, uh, that the, the, um, the benchtop product. And finally, we launch the product, we do full commercialization, we fill the pipeline in the market, and then we do um, uh, um, product checks in the market to, uh, to make sure that the product is actually delivering. We, we had a small scale, cons small scale consumer test and we extrapolated those results to the market so we need to make sure that that's, that still stands in the market. So basically, as we go, move forward, the, there's a mo uh, money, money spending increases but the uncertainty decreases. Case studies, I'm speeding up because uh, there's a buzzer here that's telling me that uh, I'm over the time. Um, Bowlicious Burst, the first case, is a product that we, where we partnered with the, uh, the packaging supplier. We capitalized on Bowlicious which is a very successful brand in Latin America. We sell close to $300 million in worldwide, out of which a significant portion comes from Latin America. So we said, well, we'll launch this product in the U.S. under the Bowlicious brand. The issue was packaging. The, 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 in Latin America, we sell single pieces. In the U.S., single pieces don't, don't really have a, an outlet, so we had to develop a different package. So we partnered with the, uh, the, the equipment vendor. We developed the right product. We launched it on the right price point. 
and um, the center field enhanced the value perception, so it was a win-win, one of those uh, low-hanging fruits that we, we, we don't usually get uh, you know, that often. Try next to in Mexico. Uh, we launched this product behind, in capitalizing on two proprietary technologies. One is whitening, teeth whitening. Second one is a recaldent. It's a proprietary uh, ingredient, active ingredient that remillerizes, that has uh, se several um, uh, benefits associated to it. Um, so we capitalized on that. We got endorsement from the Mexican Dental Association. This product sells over $40 million in Mexico. Um, the blister pack enhances value perception, looks like, like a, like a uh, uh, drug. So, so that enhances value perception. And we have effective communication that unfortunately I couldn't show the commercials, but uh, we, in Mexico we have a, one, one well-known actress sponsoring the product and, show, and saying that um, it worked for her, so it worked for, will work for anyone. So, so we, we communicate very strongly the benefit, the reason why, and we make it believable to consumers. So again, the proprietary clinically proven technologies. We have uh, the whitening based on soy stearate. We have several patents. IP is, is crucial in confectionery to compete in confectionery. So intellectual property protection is, is paramount to, to, uh, to, uh, to have a competitive edge. Because otherwise, you know, there's a lot of uh, copycats immediately. But if you have proprietary technologies, you're, you're, you're covered. Remineralization is the, the, based on recaldin, like I mentioned. That's in the product you're trying in, the, in your tables. Remineralizes teeth, so it's good for your teeth. It, it has uh, other properties that are clinically proven. It's, um, we're in a, in a, a multi-year carriers trial in, in Australia, proving that uh, we can reduce carriers by, by using uh, um, recaldin. Uh, um, also, teeth after a while are acid resistant. That also, that's also an important benefit. And finally, there's a plaque retention benefit in, 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 out of this. Um, so this is like the Lipitor of chewing gums. <laughs> to put it in, in, in known terms. Case 3 stride, where we, where we had, we, we're addressing a different thing. And again, I mentioned, we're addressing the issue of um, how we how make consumers chew, chew gum longer, or we, we capture those consumers who really like to chew gum for longer periods of time. So, so we have to... Um, one, make it, I mean, deliver, deliver the concept. Two, deliver the dry product for that concept. And three, have a, 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 a consistent communication that is appealing to consumers. So I think we got those three elements in this product. Unfortunately, the, the commercial, if we can show them later, I will show them. Do we have a position in that is called ridiculously long-lasting gum? So the commercials, in the, in the commercials, you have the, uh, the, the stride team talking about the success and celebrating the success of a product, and through a window you can see the factory. So one guy says, well, um, whoever in, in uh, accounting says that uh, if a gum lasts so long, we will be selling less product. Oh, and they go, well, and then through the window you can see that the, the factory actually stops because they, they, they stop selling product because the product is too, it lasts too long. So that's the message, so, so a humorous way to, uh, to convey the message that the product actually lasts, I mean, or, or delivers upon the concept. So there's effective communication, uh, the POP material also, I mean, creating this uh, engagement. So there's uh, many of uh, these uh, banners, uh, posters, there's a few that I have over there. So choose your flavor wisely because it will be with you for a while, so it better be good. So that type of thing. So there's a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, reiterations of the same message. This is a product that lasts too long, so um, there's some, something like uh, my aching jaw or something like that, so things of that sort. And the, the, the last element here is we, build, we open this communication channel for consumers. There's a full interactive web page, and we ask consumers to provide input to interact with the product. They, they can actually interact with the characters from the commercials. So it's a, it's a fun page. If we have the time, www.stridegum.com. And in conclusion, invest wisely, innovate smartly, and execute with excellence. That's uh, the message. That's it. <laughs> Questions? The question is how we reconcile f faster, um, fewer, faster, bigger, better with mar market differences uh, across the globe. 
Well, it's, it's a, again challenging, but uh, possible. I mean, there, there's a ways to, to um, let's say, um, I will call tropicalize products from, that generate from the U.S. I think one of the examples that, that I show how we, we took a product from Latin America and were able to uh, tailor it for, for the American market, changing the piece size, changing some, some uh, I would say, not very crucial elements, but that keep the essence of a product still, been, as long as we keep the principles that uh, there's a, a, a compelling concept and there's a, a product that delivers upon that con uh, compelling concept, I think that's, that's the key. That, well, that's, those are the, the fundamentals to, to guarantee that the, we can tailor the product to the market. Thank you. Well, excellent question. We, we, I was thinking, I, I used to work, I used to lead the, the gum based development group in, uh, in um, oh sorry, how we, how we um, incorporate uh, threading and in, 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 um, incorporating external knowledge into, into our products. So I used to lead the, uh, the gum based group in, uh, in gum base is a, is a combination of different um, in polymers, etc. And um, technologies are not developed for chewing gum. Technologies are developed for, I mean, in the, in the polymer industry, they're developed for the, 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 the high volume uh, markets, the high volume products. So uh, we partnered with, uh, with um, our suppliers, who are the, and, and they see what they have in their pipeline and, and try to uh, and adapt what they, what's been developed for uh, engine oils, for instance, interactions of, and one, one good example, engine oils, the engineered oils for, for, for engines, they actually have close to 26 components. And the reason why they had 26 components is because it all started, they tried to keep the viscosity at high temperatures. For that, they added a polymer. To keep that polymer stable, they added a modifier. To keep that modifier uh, for, for, from oxidizing that, other things. So, so they ended up with 28 components that are all essential for the, for the engineer oil. So learning why those interactions was crucial for us to, to um, achieve uh, you know, delivering uh, flavor, for instance, or, or achieving uh, texture modifiers, or even developing um, analytical methods to, to characterize our products. So we, we have a lot of uh, method, me analytical methods that come from, from other industries. They're not developed for chewing gum. Did I answer your question? Very good. Uh, have over here. Yes, can you briefly describe the process of how you came up with the color names? Um, the question is, uh, if I can describe the process, how we came up with the clever name of Stride. Uh, there were several names. In fact, the, um, I'm not sure if I can, I can reveal the code name of a project at this point, but um, it was a funny name. Um, I don't think I can. Okay, all right, that's all right. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the, the, way, the, way this, the, the way these processes happen, they're all consumer-based. So we, are, we do extensive... Uh, qualitative research, focus groups, etc. So we ask consumers. We there, there's a combination of there's a, some creative process from uh, uh, advertising agencies, our marketing staff. So we come up with options, and then we basically ask consumers which one they like, which one connects better with the concept, etc. So it's a process. It starts with um, you know a uh, think tank with the, the agency, in the, the, the multi multi uh, function team, and, and in the end the, the message is goes. Down to consumers, and we ask consumers. Three months. Oh, how long it takes? Yeah. Well, in the case of Stride, I'm not, I'm not sure, Marianne. Do you know? Yeah, there, there's things to consider. There is trademarks, for instance, is one. I mean, a lot of companies um, register um, trademarks, that, but they never use them. So we have to check that uh, it's not being used. We have to check it's not being used globally because uh, when, when we expand globally, then we have problems and we have to rename the product in a different market. Thank you. Uh, how long does the process take from the idea generation stage to the launch? Right, how long does the, the whole, the entire process takes from idea to, uh, to launch? The answer, I hate the answer, but it depends. <laughs> but but there's, there's, a, there's a range of, of complexity that uh, is, is linked to, to the, the length of, uh, the, the, of a process. Um, I will say that um, a, simple product, a simple project will be six months 
if you need to develop technology, etc., I will say you're talking about uh, 18 to 24 months, that range. This isn't really a question, it's more of an observation. I have a 16-year-old, and I assume that you can target a certain age for disability. She's a big, young children. Mm -hmm. and, and she will stay young for that, right? Yeah. <laughs> but um, in that age group, one thing she she was she was a competitor of yours, but she's a collector. So she collects the seven or eight different flavors, whether she likes all of them or not, because it's a collection. So she always gets the newest one. And I would think that in marketing uh, some of these things, if you build some connection with collection, which your competitor doesn't do. It's just the same uh, different flavors and different color packaging. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are lots of teenage kids who are, you know, the beanie baby craze who are collectors, and will collect the whole range. Uh, and she keeps those, even those that she doesn't like, replenish. So, so, so your question is, so, so your question is, do we, do we target those? Yeah. That, well, or do you use that as a... We, we cap it. Absolutely. We, that, that, there's an insight, a consumer insight associated to what, that, that uh, practice, let's say, of uh, collecting. So, so we capture that and, 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 and we try to relate that uh, and, and build the part of the emotion. There's, there's one com uh, um, component of the concept that is not, is not uh, let's say, um, necessarily, um, how can I say, uh, formal or, or it's, just, uh, it's just emotional. So, so that's, then that's in the position. So probably some elements in, in the ridiculously um, uh, long-lasting gum capture some of these, uh, I don't know, uh, um, way, way of seeing life. So, so we do capture the, uh, the different aspects. Yeah, Tom. I just have a question relative to innovation around environmentally friendly gum. Is anybody thinking through and working on a gum that dissolves or, or doesn't create the problems that you often see on trees? Possibly. The question is, question is, are we are we uh, developing uh, gum uh, that, that to address the environmental uh, environmentally friendly gum? And the answer is possibly. <laughs> well, the answer the, the, there's a, there's a few applications on on um, um, developing things that are environmentally. The thing is that the definition of environmentally friendly is is a little because uh, you can have like for instance biodegradable gum. But biodegradation takes so long that uh, it ends up being the same problem. So, so the, the solution to the problem may, may take different, different avenues, but the answer is yes, we, we're working on that. Yes? I was curious, are there ethnic formulations of different chewing gum flavors, like the Chinese tribe and uh, things of that sort? Question is, uh, are there ethnic formulations that are, specific, that are geography specific? The answer is of, absolutely. There's uh, flavors. We, we're developing a product right now for India. The, the, the chewing gum market in India is, is relatively small to, to, relative to, the, um, to the, um, the, the size of the population. And uh, we're finding that the, the flavor preferences are, are very unique and different. Uh, we have, for instance, I still remember that because we had to uh, do consumer panels of a product from South Africa. The flavor was musk. And you won't believe the sensation you feel when you chew <laughs> something that tastes like musk. It's, so it's, it's unique and different. And we had to find, that's like people in the building to, to do the, uh, the uh, internal panels because nobody wanted to chew it. <laughs> but that's, the, the answer is that absolutely. I was mentioning earlier that uh, in Brazil, for instance, we have, um, there's a fruit that you don't find anywhere else called acai that has very specific properties and it's very popular. It's not known anywhere else. So, so there's, there's a, a whole uh, flavor with uh, acai, with that, that particular uh, fruit. Yes? I'm sure everybody can target audience, but um, how do you segment that? What, what are your key target audiences? There's different ways to do that. The, the, the question is uh, how we segment consumers. And um, the answer is um, there's different ways to do that. There's um, one, one is based on... on um, uh, consumption occasions, where, where people, I mean, what people do when they consume our product, what are they doing? They're studying, they're, they're, and 
the other the other big way to can segment is uh, whether whether do they usually buy the product. So so there's different ways to segment, besides of course age and, and gender. I mean that, that that's that's uh, that's uh, basic. But um, the broad strokes, let's say, are, are you know, uh, um, consume, uh, con uh, consumption occasions is one, and um, and um, say uh, purchasing preference is, is another important one. Product-driven or marketing-driven? For instance, do you do you come up with a reason why you want a specific type of gun, or does your your chemical engineers all of them come up with a gun and say, "Hey guys, guess what? This does this. Can you sell it?" I think the question is, what drives product development? In our case, is it is it uh, market-driven or is it uh, product-driven? And I will say both. I would say in, 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 in some cases, the, uh, we, when you come up with a, a breakthrough, uh, something new, a different way, like for instance, center field products, we just uh, try, I mean, that's something that uh, is unique and different, that's a breakthrough, so that, that will be, say, product driven, so you, we create the need and, and, and the, uh, the benefit of having a center field product over, you know, um, a product that is not center field, so in that case, it will be product, product driven. In case I will say most product improvements and most line extensions come from, from the market. So we said there's a new trend, so you de definitely need to uh, keep up with the trend, or um, there's a deficiency detected in the product. There's a, there's a deficiency, or there's a no products uh, with, uh, I don't know, uh, citrus flavor in the market, so, so then that comes from the market. But I, I think there's a balance between the two. I would say that most of the innovation comes from, from uh, market insights, and, and uh, to a lesser degree, it comes from, from its product driven, basically. Thank you very much. Well, we've gone from saving lives to a luxury item that cures bad breath as well. From large to medium-sized corporation. Now we're going to jump over to a smaller type of company, an entrepreneurial company. Mark Gallant hails from Harvard, did his MBA there, and leveraged a 28-year career, 28 year career at Wall Street, leveraged that expertise and insight to bring innovation to a relatively staid industry, the foreign exchange area. So, Mark Gallant, it's all yours. Jim, right, there we go. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the, the Rothman Institute. I think it's phenomenal that, uh, that, that we, they hold these type of series. I think this is, is great. It really takes the academic and puts it together with the practitioners. As a matter of fact, if I knew about it last year, I would have come because I love uh, Clayton Christensen. He was the speaker last year. Uh, a lot of things that we did in terms of disruptive technology and disruptive innovation are going to be very practical uh, to what uh, he wrote about. Um, and what I'm going to do first is explain our company and what we do. Uh, and by the way, I think a lot of you will be confused, so at the end of it, you feel free to ask questions. My mother still doesn't understand what we do for a living, and, and she's asked me 17 times, so it, it is a little confusing. It's, it's not like gum or, or you know, hip replacements or artificial hearts. It's a little, little more confusing. That said, what is important is we are a hyper-growth company. Um, Deloitte did a survey last year of the fastest tech companies in the U.S., and Google was 14th and we were ninth. So we grew faster than Google over the last five years. Uh, and then, and that was last year. In the, in the past 12 months, in 2006, we had our fastest growing year ever, and we grew 92%. We've never grown less than 70% a year. So there are a lot of challenges and practical problems that you get when you're a hyper-growth company. I wanna talk about those, and obviously, if you're growing at 70, 80, 90% a year, you have to be innovative, or you can't keep up that, that kind of pace. Um, so once again, I want to talk about entrepreneurship and how that is different than, than being uh, innovative in a large company. I want to talk about how you grow that culture and then at, uh, over time as the company goes from a small company of just a few people to 250 people like we are now, how you keep that culture alive. So our corporate history, we started in December of 99, which is back during the dot-com boom. Uh, we focused on uh, as opposed to most dot-comers, we focused on the bottom line. We wanted to make it a real company, and we broke even in 2002. Um, and uh, basically, we've done four rounds of venture capital. And by the way, feel free to ask questions. I, I've left plenty of time at the end for, 
for questions and you can ask during, during the speech as well. But I, I tend to be very controversial. A perfect example is I'm not a believer that venture capitalists add any value. They will tell you the exact opposite, that they add tons of value. I, I don't believe they do. So, so I, I think you'll, you'll find some of the things that, I, that I'm unwilling to talk about, even on camera, maybe it'd be interesting. Um, but I think one of the, the watershed moments for us was the launch of the Forex.com brand. Um, once again, in Clayton Christensen's books, he talks about um, disruptive innovation technology, uh, disruptive technology. And what, what he talks about is that the, the, the big companies only focus on the current needs of their clients. Um, and what we did is we focused on the low end, which he talks a lot about, and, and, client, and people that weren't even clients in this market at all at that time. Um, basically, if you look at the, the pyramid of this is foreign exchange, what we do is we trade foreign exchange. So if, if uh, you were a speculator and you wanted to buy stocks and you wanted to make your own trading decisions, you go to E-Trade or you go to Ameritrade. Uh, and in the US, I think most people probably understand a little bit about stocks or a little enough, enough to make trading decisions. In the US, people aren't very familiar with foreign exchange or Forex or currency trading. Those, those are the terms they use. Um, and basically, uh, so it is a little bit more unknown but there are a lot of people, and actually worldwide, in Asia, they understand currencies more, better than they understand equities, and in Europe, it's about 50-50. But if you wanted to speculate on the price of the pound versus the dollar, which, by the way, made 20-year highs just this morning, um, uh, then you would come to us and you would uh, open an account with, uh, with Gain Capital or Forex.com, and you would uh, basically do a trade that, that uh, you know, where you speculated that the pound would go higher against the dollar or yen against the dollar or yen against the pound or whatever you wanted to do. But in the beginning, go back seven, eight years ago, the top of the pyramid was dominated by the banks and the entire industry was dominated by the banks. So this is a $2 trillion a year, sorry, $2 trillion a day market. It's 35 times bigger than equity trading in the US. So this is just an absolutely huge market that most people in this room probably don't even know about. But the, the, the banks were making billions of dollars a year, and, and some of them were making billions of dollars a year just themselves, each individual bank. But basically, the only people who were playing from the outside the banks were the Fortune 1000s um, and, and the large hedge funds. When we first started the company, Gain Capital 99, we focused right here in the mid uh, mid-sized hedge funds, and really we didn't even go to the top because at the top of this blue piece where some of the banks were participating, it was still dominated by the banks. We wanted to not have any competition from the banks. We wanted to go after people that were underserved. Um, it's a huge growth business. Hedge funds have been growing 100% in the last few years. Growth in the retail market has, has grown dramatically. Um, and, and basically it's a very high margin business, at least for us. The banks have a high infrastructure. Uh, they have their, their salesmen cost hundreds of thousands of dollars each a year to, to pay, and they can only handle a certain number of clients. What we did is we harnessed disruptive technology, which at the time was the internet, to, and 99.9% .9 of our clients trade through the internet, to handle thousands and tens of thousands of traders who the banks wouldn't touch, you know, certainly at that time with a 10-foot pole. We're talking about people that can open an account with us for as little as $250. And basically, you know, in 1999, you had to be a large institution, um, you know, uh, like a J&J &J or, uh, you know, to, 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 to trade with them. So basically, we went down the pyramid um, and started um, um, uh, going after the smaller players. And when we launched Forex.com in 2004, we even, to some degree, abandoned the blue piece of this pyramid and went all the way down to the smallest of the retail traders. Uh, in terms of market positioning, in terms of our firm and our industry, and there's about three dozen or so players in our industry, we are uh, known as the highest end. We, we, we have the most professional management team, the most professional practices. From our perspective, we want to look and act like a bank because at some point we feel, just like in, in Christensen's books, uh, they'll eventually get into this market. Uh, now, once again, they're late, and they're seven years late. But, and, and you know, firms like us have, have done a phenomenal job of, of adding value and, and, and making money in, in those seven years. But sooner or later, our feeling is they're going to come in. And instead of you know, being loose and, and cowboy-esque, we decided to, to behave like banks do, which means we, we do a lot of in, uh, investor protection. Uh, but, but in terms of innovation, some of the things we did 
uh, was we were the first to offer instant execution from real-time streaming quotes. And most of you are saying, what does that mean? Um, in the equity world, go back 10 years ago, when you wanted to buy a stock and you wanted to buy 100 shares of, of IBM, you click a button, and two minutes later, you know, maybe something would pop up. Or you go back and you check your account two minutes later. If you go back 10 years ago, it was probably 5 or 10 or 15 minutes later. But, but as time went on, it would be two minutes later. And now, you know, if you're tra trading on the E-Trade or Meritrade, you can usually buy a stock and see it a second or two later. What we did is, is, is we made it instantaneous, uh, which is even tougher in foreign exchange because the prices in the foreign exchange markets are moving incredibly dramatically and incredibly quickly. And so if you saw a price, you could click on it and instantaneously get a, get a fill. And we did this before any of the banks did. So the, the big banks, who once again were each making a billion dollars a year, didn't even have this technology when, when we launched it in, in early 2000. Um, we've, all our technology is proprietary. We built it ourselves. We thought that as a, as a cutting edge uh, tool that will keep us uh, ahead of the rest of our competition going forward. Um, and basically, we've, we've been the high end um, provider, and along those lines is, is making the fairest dealing practices for our clients. So what we talked about in the early days was gain capital. We still have gain capital. We still go after the large clients, the more sophisticated clients, the small hedge funds. But there's a limited number of those. There really aren't, you know, there's, there's thousands or tens of thousands of those type of clients. On the right side, Forex.com, and Forex, as I said, is the name that people use for this. Sort of like when you, when you make a, a copy, you say, I'm making a Xerox. You know, it, it, Forex is, is the term that people use when they're talking about currency trading. Um, and what we did is went down all the way downstream to mass market. Perfect example is, is China. We have an office in China. is our fastest growing segment. There's billions of people in China, and, and, and the, the culture in terms of speculative culture is, is phenomenal. A perfect example is, for you, for you who didn't know this, is that Macau is now bigger than Las Vegas. And Macau just five years ago was, was tiny. So there's more revenues in Macau than there are in Las Vegas. Perfect example is also that the average table bet in Las Vegas is $27. The average table bet in Macau is $75, yet they make 1 28th per capita what, uh, what uh, we do here in the States. So, so there's, the, the, there's a voracious need for speculative activity in, in, in China, and that right now is one of our fastest growing areas. Um, and once again, uh, so if you split down our clients, you see that roughly 60% of them are retail. Those are these small clients that might open with $500, $1,000. And 40% of our volume is the institutional, these bigger clients. But if you look at the actual number of clients, 98% of our actual clients are retail, but they're only doing 60% of the volume because they trade much smaller amounts. And then we have direct and indirect clients. Direct clients are basically what you do. If in, feel free after this, go to forex.com. Uh, and open a demo account, and what you can do is, is you get all the information that we give you and the, all the trading platform for free, and the only difference between opening a real account and a demo account is the money is fictitious. We give you free news, we give free charting away, we give commentary away from our traders literally 20 times an hour telling our clients what's going on in the markets, you know, literally on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. There's a tremendous amount of... of um, things that we have to give away free. And once again, this, is, this was also a very innovative practice. Back in the old days, go back 10 years ago, if you wanted some sort of information from a brokerage firm, they would charge you $20 a month or whatever. They, you know, it certainly wasn't the amount of information that we're giving away free. It certainly wasn't read, readily available in either the foreign exchange world or the equity world. Um, and right now, we're generating 25,000 leads a week from a company you know, our size uh, that, that are opening these demo accounts and, and trying out our, our product. The other 40% of our volume comes from uh, the indirect channel, and that would be brokerage firms that are already trading equities or brokerage firms that are already trading, let's say, futures. Uh, and basically, you know, we, we go to them, and they offer foreign exchange or forex to their client base, and, and uh, the client of that firm probably doesn't even know that gain is behind it. We just offer the technology and the trading and the, and the risk management uh, right through, uh, through these indirect partners. And once again, that's 40% of our current business. If you look in the old days, this is, and once again, we, we introduced Forex.com right here when the, when, the, when the curve started really ramping up. In the old days, when we were going after the more sophisticated players, 
you can see the growth wasn't nearly as dramatic. As a matter of fact, if you go back to here, June of 02, our 10 largest clients were 75% of our business. So if we lost one or two clients, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was you know, a huge and could be devastating to us. Um, kept me from sleeping well at night. Now, currently, our top 10 clients are, are, are roughly 12% of our, our, our volume. So it's really gone down dramatically. This is what it looks like. Uh, it's probably too far away from you guys to see, but these are, these are the dealing buttons. And literally, you just click once on that button, and you've bought you know, 100,000 euro. You might have bought a million euro. If you're set up, you can buy 5 million euro. Uh, against the dollar, and it's, you know, we've made it very easy to do. We have all sorts of charts, and once again, these are all free. We have news, we have commentary. This is commentary that our, that our traders give to our clients. And there's a tremendous amount of information that if you just click all these buttons, you'll get. And once again, the most interesting thing about this is it's all free to our clients, and we don't charge any commissions whatsoever. So from, from a client perspective, you have you know, free services, news, charting, and all that kind of stuff. You don't charge any commissions. And our spreads compared to the equity markets. In, in, in the equity markets, it's a penny wide. So if, if, if you're trying to buy some IBM and you're lucky, it'll be one penny wide. Our spreads are three hundredths of a penny wide. So, so we're dealing on very, very tight spreads, three hundredths of a penny wide. We don't charge commissions. And we give away a lot of free services. We'll talk about a disruptive technology and disruptive innovation. You know, if, 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 you know, when I sit down and think about it today, and say, my God, how are we going to make any money doing this? Uh, it, you know, it's amazing. Though know, what we do have is volume. You know, the old, the old saying, "You make it up in volume." Well, we make it up in volume. We do over a hundred billion dollars with a B a month in volume. So you can make really, really, really razor thin margins if you do enough volume, and you can make some good money. And we have um, something that, in terms of, of, I think that will help the entrepreneurs here. Uh, I think that it was very effective for us in terms of these this growth rates. And, and once again, we're talking about making money. You know, besides growing at 70, 80, or 90 percent a year, a, a year every single year, we also have an EBITDA margin of 40 percent, which you know is high in sort of any industry. You know, it's sort of Microsoft levels, but it's even rarer if you, you take a 40 percent EBITDA margin and couple it with growing 80 or 90 percent a year. That really takes you into you know sub half of one percent of, of the companies, or maybe sub ten, one tenth of one percent of the companies in the U.S. Um, but I think what we've done that is operational efficiency through technology. Basically, what we've done is thrown people, instead of throwing people at a problem, we try to solve the problem through technology. A perfect example is one of our competitors has five times the number of employees that we do, yet we bring in roughly five times the number of clients that they do a month. So theoretically, our, our, our workforce should be, if, if to be comparable to them, should be 25 times bigger than it is. But what we do is, is once again, we build technology that allows us to do the trading and the risk management without a lot of, a lot of people. As a matter of fact, on day one, we only had, we had eight traders in our company. That's all we had. Uh, we had you know, probably 15 employees, and eight of them were traders. Seven and a half years later, we have 250 people in our, in our company and we still only have eight traders. And that's because we've been, been able to build technology to handle those flows. And the flows are obviously you know, thousands of times bigger than, than when we started. We have a customer support tool. Because we are so unique and Forex is, is completely different than any other industry out there, we had to build our own customer support tool. But it has everything that the customer has ever done. You know, his last five trades, his last 10 trades, his P&L for the last week, day, month, year, his spreads, you know, his mother's maiden name, all his account data, his likes, dislikes, if he's ever been a problem. You know, we, we built all that ourselves. And, and client acquisition. If you were to open a, a, um, a Meritrade account or an E-Trade account today, it would probably, from the time you started to the time you actually could trade, probably take two, three, four days is how long it would take to open an E-Trade or a Meritrade account. Well, if you, uh, our clients aren't that patient. Our clients are, are very high proactive traders, and they're very, they want to do everything quickly, and that goes along with uh, signing up. Basically, we have allow now our clients, if, assuming there's no exception, to sign up in minutes. In other words, if you come to our website, um, we, they, can, they type all their information in, and now, once again, we're a regulated firm. You know, much like the SEC and the NSD, we're, we're regulated by the CFTC, and the uh, NFA. So we, there's a lot of questions we have to ask them. There's a lot of checks. We have to do social security checks on them. We have to do OFAC checks. There's a number of checks that we have to do. We have to make sure that their name matches their address, all sorts of things. 
But what we've done, instead of having humans do that, which what they do at most firms, we have our technology do it, and all these checks are done automatically as a person is signing up. So literally, we can sign up a, cl a client in minutes and do all the requisite checks that not only the CFTC and NFA would like, but our bankers, and, and one of our, my bankers is here right now from Chase, who, by the way, does a great job for us. I just want to put in a plug since, uh, since he's here. Uh, you know, the, all the same checks that they want to see, we can all do electronically. Um, uh, in terms of uh, managed account administration reporting, these hedge funds that we go after, uh, generally a hedge fund needs a back office to, do, to process all their paperwork. And generally there's three, four, five guys, or they sub it out to someone in Bermuda usually. Well, in order to get clients, because we're competing with the banks, you know, everyone knows Citibank and Goldman Sachs and those names. No one you know, certainly knew Gain Capital uh, years ago. Uh, that said, we have now taken out full page ads in Fortune, quarter page ads in the Wall Street Journal. So we're getting to the size that, that, that we're getting recognized. But in order to get these people in the door, we do extra work for them, and it's free. We don't charge them any money whatsoever to do all this back office operations. And once again, we can do that cost efficiently because we built the technology to do it, and we're not throwing humans at it. We just give them the technology, and it does it, the work themselves. So what I'd like to do, actually, before I start and tell you about my background, is there any questions about you know, sort of what we do? Because you know, if, if I didn't understand what we do, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure I would get it, but is there any questions about what we do? Once again, we're a company that we're a market maker. We actually take risk. So if you wanted to buy uh, you know, dollar yen, I would actually sell it to you. And, and you know, at that point, you know, uh, you'd be long, I'd be short. So we have risk you know, literally on every single trade. Um, so we have to have a trading group. We have to have risk managers. We have to have salesmen to, to bring the people in the door. We have to have customer support. Um, but you know, what it is is... is what we're doing, trying to do is fill a niche that really wasn't there seven years ago. The people who wanted to speculate in currencies couldn't do it before, and now we're letting them do it, and we're letting them do it as cost-effectively as the banks do. When, when we first started, sir, go ahead. I uh, gather that your customers are satisfied because they are growing at such a hyper rate. How does the customer satisfaction compare to those in equity trade? Uh, in terms of the satisfaction with, with us and our platform, it's, it's, it's very high. The, um, uh, you know, we've, we've talked to the clients before, and, and they like what we've, we've done. We get emails all the time you know, saying, thanking us for, for you know, walking them through the platform, answering their questions. Um, in general, though, though, any speculative trading is a little more difficult than, than just trading equities. And, and the big difference is, is that this is very short term. Most of our clients are in and out on the same day. Um, and it's, 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 you know, when you buy a stock and it goes down, it's now an investment. And if it goes down enough, it's an investment for your kids. Uh, so, so, you know, we, 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 but with, you know, in our business, we give out a lot of leverage. We give out 100 to 1 leverage or 200 to 1 leverage, as, as much as 200 to 1 leverage to our clients. So, you know, if you buy, uh, let's say, British Pound today, uh, and you bought it at the high, you, you know, and you levered up, you'd probably be out of that trade already, and you would have lost. So, so the thing is, is you know, some of them find it frustrating because you know it's 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 hard to learn. But that said, you know, there there's a lot of people who've done phenomenally well. George Soros, you know, broke the Bank of England and made a billion dollars on one trade, uh, was was is one example. Um, um, Paul Tudor Jones, uh, with Tudor Investment, fifteen billion dollar hedge fund has invested in us and, and he hasn't had a losing year in 20 years of, of trading and he focuses on currencies as one of his biggest things. So the little guy sometimes finds it frustrating because it's harder to do because of the leverage, but in terms of what we give them, you know, the tools, because all we, what we care about is, is giving you the tools you need to, to hopefully make successful trades. And we, we spend a lot of time on education because we want our clients to make money, we want our clients to do well because, you know, if you're getting all these clients in the door, you really want them to, to, to do well. Um, in terms of, of, of you know, the road to, to, to starting this company, basically, uh, I was a, a, a floor trader. Well, actually, I'll give you the, the quick story. Um, basically, I, I, when I was undergrad, I got accepted to, to Harvard, and they said, uh, but you have to go out and work for two years. And they, they don't even do that anymore, but, but they did it back then. So you know, I went, uh, went to work and, and, and became a floor trader for a company and I told my boss, the, the prospective boss, that I was going to go back to, to business school in two years. And he said, fine, not a problem. A year and a half later, I said, you know, I'm just going to get ready to, to go back and, and um, just want to remind you. 
And uh, he said, wait, wait a minute, you, you can't go back. You're making way too much money. I just made you a partner in the firm. You know, there's no way you can go back to, to school now. You know, you've got to be crazy to, to go back to school. Uh, and by the way, that's another trait I think of a lot of successful entrepreneurs is, is somewhere along the line, they've been called crazy several times in their career. This is just one of them. Uh, you know, I, I literally was 23 years old and making ungodly amounts of money. Uh, more cash compensation than I make now, you know, 30, 20 years later. Uh, uh, 26 years later. Um, so the point is, is, is making ungodly amounts of money. He said, well, if you go back, then it's over. You, you're going to have to quit. You're not going to be a partner anymore. Uh, so that day, I literally went to the guy next to me in the pit, and I was a, a, a floor trader yelling and screaming, trading gold and silver and, and all the things on the, on the New York um, Commodities Exchange, uh, and said, you know, do you want to back me? Do you want to give me some money to, to start, to start, you know, for me to start up trading on my own? I said, sure, I'll do it. So literally that day, I went back to, you know, to the boss who said, uh, you know, you're going to have to leave, and said, I'm out of here, and that's when I became the self-employed uh, floor trader. Uh, it turns out he was bluffing, but it was too late. I, I uh, left and, and became you know, self-employed, and then even, you know, strangely enough, I still went back to, to business school, um, and, you know, all my friends around me would say, oh, by the way, I made $25,000 today, and you're, you know, reading three cases and going to class every day. It seemed, it seemed a little strange at the time. Uh, after business school, I went back and actually still was a self-employed trader for a number of years, uh, and then went to the banks, and was a managing director 16 years ago at a bank, um, uh, making a lot of money, but the point was, it wasn't a good fit. Um, I really didn't like it that much. It was way too political. It was much too bureaucratic. My wife said, you're much too nice a guy to be on Wall Street. And once again, I did another crazy thing, which was, and, and this time, this was uh, um, in, uh, in 91, no, no, sorry, 94, I left Wall Street. Now, a lot of people left in, in the dot-com boom because, you know, they can make billions of dollars, but 94, very few people, you know, were make, managing director level on Wall Street, making a ton of money, left to go be an entrepreneur. Uh, and I was the number two person at a, this little entrepreneurial financial technology firm that only had 12 people in it. So, so once again, you know, and everyone at that point thought I was crazy as well to, uh, to do that, but I was having a lot more fun. And I think, you know, one piece of advice, and there's not as many young kids here as I, as I thought, but certainly to, to the younger people, is that you have to have fun. You, don't, you shouldn't worry about what your parents want you to do, or what your friends want you to do, or what's going to make you a lot of money. What you have to do is you have to have fun, because if you don't have fun every day going to work, you don't enjoy what you do, you're not going to be happy, and you're not going to make a lot of money. And my, my philosophy, and, and a lot of people I know, especially entrepreneurs, you know, do what you like to do, and the rest of it will take care of itself. So, I went and, and, and you know, took a, you know, probably a 90% pay cut and went to work for a small uh, financial firm. Um, basically, the industry in 99 uh, was dominated by the big banks. Uh, and compared to the online equity trading, the Forex market was real laggard in terms of technology, dealing practices, professionalism, ease of use. And basically, I thought I, uh, we could do a better job. That's what I thought. I thought we could do a better job than what was out there. Um, First to offer a click and deal, first to be one second execution, uh, without going into what these orders are, very sophisticated orders uh, that we gave our clients and our banks that trade with us now every day, you know, haven't offered these same orders to, to us, to the big clients, five years after we gave them to our, to our clients. So talk about innovative, the, you know, the bank, we were way ahead of the banks. We uh, increased price transparency. When we first started, the spreads that, that uh, that these little customers were getting were like 100 pips wide or 150 point, points wide, and the bank clients, the big bank clients, were getting three pips wide. Well, what we do now is we give our clients three pips wide. So, so in just seven years, what the big players at the big banks, the Soroses and the, the huge corporations, the width that they were getting is now what our client with $250 gets. Um, never stop evolving. When we bought Forex.com, we changed our direction again. We went from sophisticated traders all the way down, once again, down the curve, like Christensen, to, to small people that never had traded before. And, and we cut our transaction size to one-tenth of what it was before. And we launched these mini contracts, which are really you know, very small. And for, for months, we were debating, should we do this? You know, should we tarnish our image? We have this image of very, being very sophisticated, having great technology, having some big, very sophisticated traders with us. But when Forex.com came about, we said, you know what we'll do? We'll go after the little guys in Forex.com, and we'll keep all our big, sophisticated players that gain capital, 
and and basically we, we launched these mini contacts and uh, contracts and now 80 percent of our of our business comes from them uh, we are a quick follower and you know the advice here is you don't have to be you know first mover it doesn't have to be your idea you just have to do it better startup culture was flat hierarchy it was myself my managers and the employees we had no budgets risk-taking mentality most important was speed you got to do everything quickly you got to get it out we got to get it into the clients hands today I said we've grown faster than Google 250 people only one more layer of management myself my managers managers underneath them and the employees it's a pretty flat organization even with 250 the budgets are still fluid. I really, you know, don't budget per se, uh, um, and, and people have to, you know, have to, you know, tell ask their managers to, to spend money. Perfect examples: last year, we doubled our marketing from the year before, and halfway through the year, we thought that we could uh, get some more bang for the buck, and we doubled it again mid-year. So we quadrupled our, our marketing from from the year before. Um, that's where it's fluid, um, and basically, in, in the speeches that we give to to our uh, people, we have a run and gun mentality, so we still have it. Best practices, open door, keep asking for ideas, reward them on the spot when they have new ideas, um, and um, keeping the management team up, up to date. And then last best practices, this is the last slide, is I think most importantly is allow for mistakes. But never punish anyone for making a mistake. You have to encourage people to take risk. So if they make a mistake, all you do is you point it out, you fix it, and you move on. You can't punish them. There can't be repercussions for, for making mistakes. Um, make everyone an owner. If you make everyone an owner, you give them all shares, they will think like an owner. They'll think about the bottom line. They'll say, you know, that printer, if I was at my house, would I buy that printer for, for, for my office or, or, or not? They think like an owner if you give them shares. And once again, avoid dogma. Successful companies continually evolve. You have to keep your eye out for what's going on. You can't um, you, you can't be afraid to try new things and once again and not everything works so you try some stuff it doesn't work you try it you move on you fix it but you can't wait around you can't overanalyze opportunities you have to jump on them and move and I think that's why the speed is, is the reason we've been able to grow 70 80 90 percent a year is because we see an opportunity and sometimes we make it a reality in 24 or 48 hours that quickly um, there's no eight-month process if something takes more than three weeks uh, that's a long time in our shop bet between idea and reality. Um, at this point, I'm open for questions. Any any questions of, about um, what we've done or, or or how we do it? You mentioned that you reward uh, ideas on the spot. For example, for example, I actually have um, a, a stack of hundred dollar Amex, Amex gift certificates uh, for for hundred dollars, just like cash. And the point is, if someone comes up with a new idea, and it doesn't have to be some great idea, it's just you know, uh, let's ask. The, the clients this or, or or let's you know add this when we're when we're you know you know you know when we're when we're you know when we're, we're taking their information you know, you know these are quite often very small ideas but the point is is if you give them the hundred dollar gift certificate and you do it in front of their peers everyone likes the you know everyone likes to you know it's not even the hundred dollars it's it's the fact that 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 you know the, the CEO or the number two person also has a stack of these two stack of these these things around here and we give them out because the point is 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 if, if you, if you get rewards, you know, not only the $100, but the pat on the back in front of your comrades, they're, they're more likely to, to, you know, offer up ideas. Now, once again, not every idea gets it, because sometimes ideas aren't good, but the point is you always encourage more ideas. And the, and the good ideas, you literally, you, you go and you, and you give it out and you make sure people know. Uh, you know, you're growing from the factory. I'm wondering, what, you, what has been uh, the biggest challenge for you as a business owner, uh, particularly uh, as you find yourself sinking into... Uh, that's more structure or anything like that. I'm wondering what is your, your biggest challenge? Bandwidth actually is, is my biggest, sorry. Oh, sorry, I apologize. What is, what is my biggest challenge as, as an owner uh, with, with growing this fast? I apologize. Um, basically, I think it's bandwidth. It is, you know, is when you're growing this fast, and, most, and I've grown in you know, other companies at 20 or 30 or 50% a year, people don't realize that growing 80 or 90% a year is, is an incredible stretch of time. You can't keep up, you can't hire fast enough. No matter how much time you spend hiring, you're not hiring fast enough. Perfect example is, is I, uh, just uh, yesterday, I had six investment bankers come to talk to us, and you know, thinking about going public and all that stuff. And, and theoretically, what I should have done, what I really should have done is had my senior management team there to meet them, and they would get to know each other. My point is, no, no, no. I want my senior management team working. I want them making new products. I want them you know, doing stuff. So literally, and, you know, it, and it wasn't the right thing to do, but the point is, is if you're the entrepreneur, you have to make the tough decisions. 
I sat alone with six investment bankers and did the entire discussion. So my point is I didn't want to take my senior management team away from what they were doing. So the point is, is, is being protective of people's times, especially senior management, is, is I think the, the, toughest, the toughest thing. Um, we're at a stage where we get some suitors for our company. We're at a stage where we get some interest from the outside. I'm wondering from your perspective, if you had that, uh, you know, potential buyers, and then how do you balance that? What's your thinking for them? The question is, is, is you know, there are uh, uh, firms you know, getting potential suitors, potential buyers. Now, I've done four rounds of venture capital, so, so I have sort of, you know, five sort of semi-buyers already, and, and if you go to the board meetings, they certainly, they certainly think they, they run the company. That's where the, the stress comes. I still think I run the company, and they think they run the company. So, um, but, but from that perspective, I, I think one advice is, first of all, you know, you have to think about, you know, who you're bringing on board and what they're going to do, because th th those really are important decisions. You know, you know how is life going to change, you know, when you give up control, let's say, in my case, to, to venture capitalists who now own more than 50% of the company. Um, you know, it, it really does slow down growth, um, and, and, and you can't move as quickly, because once you're entrepreneurial and your management team wants to do something, you can do it in a day. The bigger picture, you know, if, if, if it's a big enough thing, you're going to have to run to your board. They're going to run back to their people, and it takes weeks and weeks and months. So for me, that's been one of the most frustrating things. Um, but, you know, as any entrepreneur, you want to liquefy your holdings. So, so the flip side of that is, is, you know, while things are good, you do want to take some money off the table. So I guess the suggestion I have is, is, is you really have to be careful about selling the whole thing out. But sometimes the best thing to do is sell a piece out. You liquefy your holdings. Um, it reduces your stress level, uh, but, but you also have to determine, you know, how much um, uh, control you give the, the investors. And my answer, my suggestion is give them as little as possible. Um, any, uh, any, uh, any other questions? You had said that you had vacillated in the beginning from going to your market, sophisticated traders to the mass market. What was the decision that made you go to the mass market? And how long before your break-even point? Well, the, the, we were actually break even by the time we got it. It was really this, this, this URL Forex, because people, when they talk about speculating currency, they call it trading Forex. So it was, it was, it was, you know, it was available to be bought. It shows you how unsophisticated the industry was. You know, I, we were able to buy it at, at, I think, you know, now it looks like a dirt cheap price, but even at the time, it was, was a very reasonable price. And the thing is, is from our perspective, it was sort of like getting the URL cars.com. You know, if, if you were, you know, if you had a, a company that, that somehow has something to do with automotive products, and you get the URL cars.com, everyone's going to understand cars, you know, or cars.com. So the thing is, when we got that URL, we said, you know what, this is the time to go all the way downstream, go down as far as you can go, and really spend some money and go mass market. And Samantha Rohde, who's our head of marketing back there, and, and the one who was, by the way, went over the speech with me at 10 o'clock at night last night for the first time, um, uh, you know, uh, is, is the one who really pressed the, the metal, you know, to the, to, you know, to the floor and, and spent the money to go mass market. And it really was very revolutionary for us because we went after the, you know, very few, very sophisticated clients to mass market. But at the time, you really had, really had to make a tough decision. But the way we did it was literally separate the two brands, um, the Forex.com brand and the game brand, you know, one was about education and, and these little contracts, and one was about sophisticated. And we're the only firm in our industry that did that, that really, you know, so, so what we did is we mitigated our risk by doing another brand, uh, but we got, a, 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 you know, a, a URL that was so ubiquitous that it would be, you know, very helpful in, in that endeavor. And that's, that's what uh, made that decision. Um, what They're pretty much all here. I mean, the, the interesting thing is, is a perfect example is Samantha, who I mentioned, uh, was the first employee. And I, she came from my previous job, the one where I was the number two executive. And she came even before we, uh, uh, we got funded. So, so basically, she came and, and didn't get a paycheck for three months. So that shows you that, uh, that, uh, that she also is a risk taker. Um, that, that, you know, and the, the senior management team that's there today is, is really um, is Samantha. The COO of my old company is the COO of this company as well. Uh, and the number two person uh, really is the bulk of the management team. We've added a CFO about a year ago. Um, so he's the, sort of the only new one. But, but really, those four same people that were around seven years ago 
are still there today. And what you have to have is the passion. You have to, you know, choosing your, your senior management team is the most critical thing you, you can do. You have to know what you're good at, uh, and then what you gotta do is, is give the rest to, to, to the other people who are better at it than, than you are. Uh, and, you, and you have to give them you know, the flexibility, and you have to get the right people. You have to get people with passion, and you have to give them enough equity so that if this thing works out, there's rewards at the end of the rainbow. So, so none of my, my team is here for the cash compensation, uh, but they are here for if this thing works out, and it looks like it is working out at this point, um, that, that the, 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 you know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow will be big enough to, to do that kind of work. I mean, a perfect example is, is you know, the fact that the Sam was here at 10 o'clock last night working with me on, on this, you know, on the speech, you know, isn't unusual, you know, isn't overly unusual. The point is, is, you know, that's the kind of commitment and conviction that you have to get from your, for team to be this kind of, to have this kind of success. Question, I think we're all uh, innovators and risk takers here. And what, what advice would you have for us if we wanted to incorporate currency trading in our portfolio to dramatically reduce our return? <laughs> Uh, that's harder than it looks. Uh, that, 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 that trading currencies, you know, just like any new financial product, is, 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 is tougher than it looks. Now, that said, we, we, we had a, pr a client literally started with $22,000 and a year later had $4.5 million in his account. Now, that said, I got, you know, a lot more clients that start with 1000 and have zero now. So, so the point is, 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 is it, it's tougher than it looks, but in any endeavor, it's all about work and study and, and trying to be the best at it. And the thing is, is you know, if, you, if, if you study hard enough and you learn and you're willing to learn, you know, my feeling is you can be successful with just about anything. Uh, the, you know, the problems that we see with, with a lot of our client base is that they, they do it and they're, they're not trying to learn. They're, they're just, you know, they're, they're doing it on a whim. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're, we're writing the book right now, uh, Forex uh, Currency Trading for Dummies. So, so that's something that we'll be giving out to every person who signs up and it's coming out uh, you know, in three months from now. But the point is, is you know, there we give you all the tips and type of things. Last question. Question mark is uh, one facet of entrepreneurship is that uh, you build value and you're, you're, um, you sell or you, you move out to move, move on to something else. So, so, so do you see that in your, in your horizon that, that you, you build a lot of value, obviously. So there will be a, an opportunity for you to uh, sell and move on to something, to the new thing that um, you know, your, your creative mind is, is, is thinking of. No, I think that, that will happen with me. You know, for me, this seven and a half years is the longest I've ever been anywhere. I, you know, I'm your, as you can probably tell, typical ADD kind of guy. I usually spent three years at, at a place was a long time on, on Wall Street. And you know, thank God I was a trader on Wall Street because you know, I, I'd be talking to 17 different guys and have different, you know, looking at six screens at once. But the point is, is yes, I think you know, in a matter of you know, years, uh, and you know, only a few years that, that at some point will probably be bought, uh, and I'll probably be moving on to, to my next thing. Because you know, if you have the entrepreneurial blood in you, you want to do it again. You, know, you, you, you absolutely want to do it again. The question is, you know, what is it going to be next time? Um, I'm not sure what that is going to be, but, but I'm sure it'll be a fun ride, and, uh, and I'm sure uh, you know, uh, I'm already thinking about who I'll take along for that ride. So, so once again, uh, afterwards, if you want to come by, thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Mark.